So our session is climate change and food security. And I think since the session started yesterday, I was watching on, 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 on Zoom, uh, climate change has been mentioned many times. And the World Economic Forum Global Risk Report, um, actually since around 2017, they've been listing environmental um, challenges as the as part of the top 10 uh, global risks in the next 10 years. And you know the failure in climate action is one of those, the weather extremes, biodiversity laws, are some of the stuff that are coming up as you know the next risks that we that the risks that we can have in the next 10 years so so this topic um of this session is really important in that regard uh for this session so you are going to engage with the six of us so it's me and dio the two of us that have just been introduced then uh we managed to get really great speakers we have uh professor amir agagok chak um, who's going to be our first speaker and the main speaker of the session. And then we've got Professor Nana Kluze uh, from Ghana. We've got Professor Catherine Nakalembe, uh, who's based in the USA. And then we've got Professor Khaled uh, Sasi from, from Tunisia. You can see that in terms of distribution, we have really tried to cover different parts of, of Africa. So in terms of the challenges that we are dealing with, we know with food security, we, we, we are basically dealing with, with sustainable development goals. So we know that goal two is on um, zero hunger. And when you combine the question of um, you know, population increasing and the fact that you know, as the population is increasing, you are using more land you know, for people to build houses and to build malls and all of that, that reduces the amount of land that is available for agricultural purposes. And you are also increasing demand for, for energy. And we know that climate, climate change is, is happening. I was watching some documentary where a specialist actually says he, he, ne he no longer calls this climate change, but climate changed, you know, to indicate that climate has already happened. We, we are already seeing these, these changes. The number of extremes are changing. Uh, the number of extremes are increasing in South Africa in April. We had a weather system that resulted in the death of over 400 people. And when we look at the weather system, I'm trained as a meteorologist. The system looked like a mid-latitude system. Generally, we call them cut-off lows. They result in a lot of rainfall over South Africa. But then when it got to the coastal um, province, which we call KwaZulu-Natal, it started behaving like a tropical system. So even after today, I mean, we just looked at it as meteorologists and we didn't know what to say. It caused a lot of confusion. Uh, La Union is the um, um, uh, RSMC Regional Specialized Meteorological Center that specializes in tropical cyclones in the Indian Ocean. They decided to name it, and normally we, they, they don't get named. So, and they called it Subtropical Cyclone ISA, and, and normally that is not something that we have. So, climate it has indeed um, started started happening. And what that means is that we we also need we need to start thinking about um, adaptation, and that speaks to um, you know, thinking about um, the response of plants uh, to climate change, we need to find or develop new crop varieties that can withstand uh, environmental uh, stresses that will be associated with this climate change. And we need to improve our agricultural um, practices. And one of the things, again, that we need to be thinking about are um, uh, multi-hazard early warning systems. So the UN plans to have everybody getting access to these early warning systems in the next, in the next five years. So I added this as just further to talk to some of the challenges that that we have got. So so with the when you see weather forecasts and seasonal forecasts or climate change projections, generally they are based on numerical weather and climate models. And on the African continent, we are not really making much in terms of contributing to developing uh, these types of models. I mean, we know the types of equations that they are based on. We know. If you are running globally, you have to use low resolution, but we've got techniques to you know, get high resolution on the area that you are interested in. Um, and there are parametrization schemes. So that is where you talk about processes that the models are not able to represent explicitly. And that is where we are getting challenges and we are getting uncertainty um, from, from all these models. Um, we have started what we call a model development initiative. Um, 
and that is to build capacity um, well, in South Africa, but we've also been working with, with Southern Africa in general to build capacity to develop models because these models are used as black boxes in general, and you don't really want that. And some studies have found that um, when you use the UK model, it's called the unified model, it, it's able to capture thunderstorms in the UK, but the thunderstorms in the UK are different to thunderstorms that occur in South Africa. In South Africa, it makes thunderstorms big, like the right size that is observed, but in terms of intensity, the model is not able to get that intensity. This event that I've just mentioned, the models missed the amount of rainfall uh, such that the South African Weather Service basically increased the warning level. Uh, when the rainfall was already pouring. So they issued a warning and um, basically nothing much happened because the warning level was really low. And then the South African Weather Service got calls to say it's really bad here, it's really bad here. And then they increased the warning level. But I mean, when it's already happening, what do you do? You can't move people, it's, it's, it's there, it's flooding already. So which is why we need to, to be working with the local scientists to improve models so that they can represent processes well um, everywhere. The issue of observations, um, we see it, it's there, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, if, if you look at these are observations that go to the ECMWF, it's a, it's a European center that does numerical weather prediction. And you can see on the African continent, there's not much on the Southern, in the Southern hemisphere, there is not much. There is hope in satellite information. What this figure is showing you is forecast with different lead times. So below here, you've got a lead time, uh, you've got a forecast skill for, for the Southern hemisphere and then above its focus skill for, for the Northern Hemisphere. So if you just look at one example of this, you can see there's somewhere where the gap started getting narrower and that was when uh, satellite information got introduced in weather forecasting. Um, but that does not mean that we don't need ground observations. Um, so what I'm showing you here, this is supposed to be 24 hour rainfall. Uh, for one specific day over Botswana. So these are ground observations from the Botswana Meteorological Services. This is a rainfall product from NASA. Um, this is a reanalysis from, they are from, from Europe and we consider them as the best. And this is a rainfall product from University of Reading. So now if I say I want to improve models and I run my model, I want to know what happened with rainfall and all these are observations and they look so different from one another, then what, what should models be targeting and how should we be improving uh, these models? Um, so this is my last slide where I want to talk about some good news um, <laughs> that are happening. Um, it was mentioned that I, I work for the South African Environmental Observation Network, uh, which is part of the NRF. And we've got a vision to build world-class environmental research platforms for a sustainable development, uh, for, sus for a sustainable society. Um, the South African government has started what they call the South African um, Research Infrastructure Roadmap, SARIR, where they are investing a lot of money towards large infrastructure that are long-term that you know one single institution will not be able to fund or keep running for a long time. And, uh, through Scion, we are running three three different um, RIs. We've got one where we are putting up observations throughout the, the country. There are some landscapes that have been identified where we will go, we'll take observations, meteorological observation, atmospheric chemistry, uh, hydrological information over land. And we've got one which, which is called shallow marine and coastal research infrastructure where we want to be able to take observations across the whole coastline of South Africa. And we've got one which is called Sapri South African Polar Research Infrastructure, um, where we want to be able to take observations uh, in these uh, the three oceans, in the, in the Atlantic, in the Indian, and, and then in the Southern Ocean. We want to be able to take observations all the way to, to Antarctica. So there are huge investments that the South African uh, government is putting behind these and and uh, the data, the good news with this, generally the data is closed in South Africa. The data that's going to be coming out of these platforms is going to be open. So it's available for, for research. If you want to make comparisons of what's happening in South Africa and other parts of the world, that data will be there. I'm going to hand over now to Dai. Um, so Mary Jane presented what I think is a high level or a high level sort of, um, you know, introduction. And she did mention that we're facing extremes in weather patterns. We're facing extremes in climate change incidences. It's not only the extremes. The most important of those changes we're seeing is the variability. Today, it snows. Tomorrow, it doesn't. 
So the question is, what's going on exactly? How do we capture those variabilities? So I am gonna present very quickly two aspects of the research I do in my group that informs how we capture some of these variabilities. One is a highly stylized model. She also mentioned models and representation of reality. I'll show why some stylized models give us information about what we expect, especially with energy investment in renewable technologies. Then I'll zoom in and look at what is the extent literature actually saying? And what can we learn from that literature? By model, energy systems is my focus. We're looking at the near future where we're growing into renewables. We want solar panels, we want windmills, we want geothermal systems, more hydro if possible. The last hydro system in the US was over 30 years ago. Can we build more? Those are the questions we're asking. And we try to shed light into the mixture of these technologies. So remember we mentioned that there are uncertainties, variabilities. I try to capture some of those uncertainties in a stylized model. And that's what I do in asking this question. Can we develop stochastic optimization models? And I'm excited to see that the Office of Naval Research actually has a program called mathematical programming, which is where research of this nature lies. So basically we're looking at modeling environmental policy. By the way, many African countries tend to have policies that are not really enacted. They exist in books only. So the question here is, how can some of these policies come alive? So we're looking at uncertainties in those policies. Uncertainties in demand, temperature is increasing. So there is variability in demand. And then uncertainty in the performance of the technologies. That's what I call capacity factor. Can we model these uncertainties in a two-stage optimization model and then begin to inform decision-making? Well, I'm not gonna go into the details of the math. This is just to show that we actually capture realizations in mathematical models. So for example, I'm looking at the total cost of a given system of satisfying the demand for electricity. We're always trying to minimize cost. Even if you had unlimited resources, you still want to minimize cost. So that's one of the, but then in trying to minimize the cost, there are constraints, constraints related to the technical performance of the technologies related to the expected demand in the market, constraint related to the expected cost. Remember I mentioned uncertainty. So what we do with uncertainty is we try to model them by drawing from stated distributions. Now we draw from stated distributions. We have a whole bunch of these uncertainties, including uncertainty in policy. For example, in the US, we have the renewable, renewable portfolio standards, which mandates that if you're a utility in any given state, a certain percentage of your output must come from a renewable resource. What percentage is that? By a certain deadline. Across the state, across the US, you find some states actually having the policy in place, whereas there are other states that don't. So the question is, how do we reconcile those differences? So in those stylized models, we make simulations of some of the things that Mary Jane presented. We make simulations on the distributions of the parameters that we use in our model. These simulations are based on our assumptions of what the actual reality is. And then we come up with results suggesting what the technologies combination should be and how should we make those investments in those technologies. These are the kind of things we do. Now I take it a much further in a project where we're saying what has happened in the literature, especially when you look at food energy water systems. When we look at what has happened, we can actually model the entire nexus of food energy water systems in an integrated fashion. Given that status, we said, what has been done model-wise? So you can look at 350 papers published between 2010 and 2019, a 10-year period. And we see that conceptual models, analytical, literature review, material flow analysis, governance, optimization, complex adaptive systems, and systems that agent-based modeling. These are the type of models we've seen that are out there in the literature. Now the question becomes, when you look at the globe, what's going on where? Well, we are not so particular about the rest of the world. Hey, governance and policy evaluation, for example, the same issues we have in the US where there are variabilities across the states. For example, in Texas, 
The price of a renewable energy certificate, solar regs, we call them, go for less than a dollar a unit. Then go to Massachusetts, where it's over $400 a unit. How do you reconcile such markets? Those issues are also prevalent in Africa. That's the green slice of the pie I'm showing here. So the question we're saying is, how? What are the things not expressed in the models? Now, the speakers that are going to come after me, they are going to shed more light into some of the missing parameters that are projected in those slides based on spatial temporal differences and intertemporal differences. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Amir Agakuchak, who is coming from University of California in um, Irving. We have Dr. Dana Brown from University of Ghana, Legon. We have um, Katrina Kalembe, who actually got a bachelor's from Makarere University. She's gonna join us from College Park, University of Maryland, and finally, Khaled Sassi, who is coming from Tunisia. These guys are going to show us things that are going on on the ground with pictures to validate. That is not just about maps to show you what's going on. So I can't wait to get started. Um, can we bring on?